Well, it might have sounded pretty good. You know, it is nice to have this structure to designing an information system, and it is nice to maybe have a better idea of the time and budget once you have an idea of what the system should look like. There's all these benefits to the SDLC, but there are still problems, unfortunately. SDLC is not a perfect system. Let's take a look at why. The first is what is known as the SDLC waterfall, or the waterfall nature of the SDLC. So the idea is that you kind of treat the software development lifecycle method as a waterfall. And the um, actual chart that we have used to talk about the SDLC is shaped a bit like a waterfall. You start off at system definition and then you fall into um, requirements analysis and then you fall into components definition. You're following the flow of the um, actual software development life cycle. It goes in one direction. So you go from system definition to requirements analysis. Once you are at requirements analysis, ideally you are done with system definition 100%. You never need to revisit that. And then once you flow from requirements analysis into component definition, you are never going back to requirements analysis, at least not right now. Um, you're done with that phase and you are just working on component definition based on the requirements which are set in stone. You have followed the current down into the component definition pool. Uh, you rode the waterfall down in there and you can't really go back up. That's what people kind of mean when they say that it is a bit of a waterfall is that you don't, ideally you don't go back up the waterfall because it is pushing you back down. That's how the methodology is built to work. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to bring out your inner salmon and swim back up the waterfall. If you realize in the requirements section when you're talking to users that, hey, we don't actually have a good idea of what the system is supposed to be, then you have to swim back up to the waterfall, go back to system definition, update the system definition, and then go back down, revisit the analysis, and then continue talking to users, and then, oh no, we still don't have a good idea for what we need from the users, so we, we, we need to update the system definition to get the requirements back down or something like that. Or, another example is because you're doing all the research into different software alternatives uh, that are on the market, after you have made the requirements, well, your research might actually inform you that your requirements are not sufficient. So then you have to sort of swim back up and say, hey, uh, future users, I'm sorry, we have to hold more meetings. I know we said we were done so far, but we need to bring you all back. We need to revisit these requirements and update you on everything. And that, that can be really tricky. And hopefully you don't keep bouncing back and forth between requirements analysis and component design and then implementation and then implementation just doesn't work for reasons you didn't realize so then you have to swim all the way back up to requirements analysis or even system definition and then go back down and that doesn't look good to management they're not going to be happy that they're paying you to flounder around like that uh they're gonna see that your salmon behavior of swimming up the waterfall they're gonna see that as being a little fishy if you catch my drift so that can be a downside with the SDLC, this waterfall nature. Um, so this has caused some businesses to try to move away from this methodology. I kind of got into this in the last um, point, but requirements, it can be really difficult to completely and usably document your requirements from the very beginning. Um, in the textbook, actually, uh, one of the authors uh, was working on a massive project in Boeing that had, uh, what he was saying, 70 labor years. So collectively, the entire team on the database portion of a software project spent 70 years of time 
working on this database and ended up with a seven foot tall stack of requirements, which then, you know, you have to use in order to create a usable database. 70 pages of requirements, you're probably going to lose something there. So it can be really hard to document everything completely in a way that is usable. The examples I kind of gave were uh, incomplete requirement uh, documentation or incorrect requirements or something like that. But also there's this other side where completely documenting requirements can be kind of impossible to work with. Um, it's very hard for complicated systems like what the author was talking about here and a lot of information systems are going to be extremely complicated because they will involve a huge amount of moving parts they might have a huge amount of users that are working with them and you need to have a lot of um, requirements when that kind of happens if your requirements are unwieldy, if you have so many requirements that you have a seven foot tall stack of pages, for example, or if your requirements are extremely dense, or if they're contradictory, or if they're incomplete or something like that, you might as well have no requirements at all. And even with the unwieldy requirements, if you have really, really good requirements, you have everything completely documented down to every single possible use case ever of a system and you have too many that you know you might as well have just a bad set of requirements or no requirements at all because it's going to be really hard for a system to take account of everything so that is a huge point of difficulty when it comes to the software development lifecycle, because when you have this, I, I'm going to focus in on this example that uh, the author is talking about with uh, the huge stack of requirements like this, the software development lifecycle prioritizes taking care of everything at once. So it's not an option with this lifecycle to split things up and take things a piece at a time. You have to do everything in that exact order and for complicated systems with a lot of moving parts that can be extremely hard that can be even impossible if you have any big enough system imagine if the entirety of uh the google search engine was created using the software development life cycle if they tried to do just everything at once um, there's a lot of really complicated features in the Google search engine. The databases are extremely complicated. The hardware is immense because they're running on a huge amount of cloud machinery. In fact, that's the reason why they were able to get into cloud computing, offering cloud computing as a service because they had so much hardware and they're able to get so much hardware. Uh, the software component, the... Uh, the algorithms that they're using, the machine learning, the um, information that they're using to collect, uh, or sorry, the algorithms they're using to collect information from users and store it in these massive databases. And, you know, who knows how many people are working on that kind of stuff or what the procedures for those um, jobs look like, right? So if they had to start from scratch and get to where they are now using the system development life cycle that could be next to impossible. They might prioritize other methodologies. The author describes analysis paralysis as something that can result from spending too much time documenting before even getting into a project. If you are spending so much time on actually setting up the project to make sure you have everything right, that you can't actually get into working on anything, that's that analysis paralysis. And at some point it gets to be 
harmful to the project because you're wasting time and you're wasting budget. You want to have a good set of requirements, but you may not be able to have a perfect set, especially for a complicated project like this. And then, hey, scheduling and budgeting difficulties. We talk about how SDLC can sort of help with that once it's already part of the way through the um, actual life cycle, but management doesn't like that. They like to know everything up front. They like to say, hey, we need this to be done in this amount of time with this amount of money. No more. No more time, no more money. But like we talked about, things can get really complicated and it can be really hard to give an accurate estimate, especially to someone who doesn't understand that things can be really complicated. Um, so the scheduling and budgeting difficulties remain an issue, even with what SDLC can do to try to address some of that. Also, the SDLC time and budgeting help that it can give is also dependent on, you know, the fact that it assumes you don't go back up the waterfall. If anything does go wrong, any help that SDLC can give with regards to scheduling and budgeting kind of goes out the window. So, unfortunately, um, there are quite a bit of flaws. And SDLC, because of that, is not necessarily used as widely as maybe that it used to be. So that is the software development life cycle, the problems that it can have. And a lot of these problems can be addressed by the other um, methodology that I mentioned at the very beginning called Agile. Agile is maybe comparable to taking SDLC but doing it extremely fast and over and over and over and over and over again. You run through this very quick development phase to develop a small portion, test it, make sure that it's working, get a lot of feedback, recognize that that feedback might make huge changes to the project itself, and then, you know, you test it, you try to get like a small component working, you try to get the requirements for everything, for that small program, or that small component at least, you try to get those nailed really well, and because it's a small component, you're not going to have a ton of requirements or something like that. You're just working on the requirements for a small piece. And then you start it again. You work on the next component. Boom, 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 boom. You know, define that component, get the requirements, uh, figure out what it needs to look like, actually implement it, and then make sure that the two components that you've developed work well together after you test that second one individually. You test, you, you unit test, you put them together, you test the whole thing, make sure they work together. And then you start the next one. Boom, 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 boom. Unit test, uh, integrate, test them all together, and so on and so forth. And the whole time you're trying to get user feedback. So that is uh, the sort of idea of Agile. And Agile also has... Um, additional subtypes. Uh, Scrum is one that is coming to mind, but I'm not necessarily going to go into that. Uh, there is chapter extension 17 in this book. It's near the very end um, that you can actually look at and learn a little bit more about Agile and learn some more about Scrum development as well. But these new development methods were meant to be a lot more flexible. They were meant to allow for the fact that requirements might change over time, and they were meant to integrate user feedback even more than the SDLC already does. So users actually get input throughout the entirety of the project as the different components are being designed. With Scrum, I think it's even less defined out in phases in terms of like the definition versus the requirements versus the actual components versus the implementation and stuff. It's a lot more cycles of just get a component going, 
rush to try to make it and test it and all that kind of stuff and then come back and get feedback. It, it kind of follows that loop. But regardless, if you want to learn more about Agile and the ways that it might try to address some of the problems with the software development lifecycle, then chapter extension 17 and possibly even external research might be a good place. Um, regardless, that is the summary of some of the issues of the software development life cycle. And that is our chapter 12 discussion as a whole. Thank you all for watching.